Hi, I'm David Chambers, Deputy Director for Implementation Science uh, at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and uh, this is a walk through fidelity and adaptation, uh, two topics that end up being quite central to our overall uh, efforts in dissemination and implementation research, as we'll discuss. Uh, so the purpose of this particular talk is to walk you through uh, how these concepts have uh, been defined and have evolved over time and get some thinking uh, for any of your studies how uh, these concepts will, will feature in, in your research designs and your thinking about key questions and uh, in the outcomes that you choose to focus on uh, through the life of your, uh, your efforts. Um, so, uh, many of you may have seen this already. This is a, a 2009 paper uh, that Enola Proctor led that some of us had the fortune of being involved in and basically just lays out that broad uh, look at implementation science that we have different interventions on the left uh, that we focus on how we get them implemented, the implementation strategies, and then we have a whole set of outcomes that those of us who are studying dissemination and implementation uh, are uh, very much uh, keen on. You'll notice uh, a little bit of red uh, and uh, gets a little bit bigger uh, in, in terms of fidelity as one of those key implementation outcomes that was referenced as needing to be, um, needing to be present if we're to understand whether implementation strategies uh, work in assisting evidence-based practices in getting to the people that might be able to benefit. Um, so what does that actually mean? So fidelity we define typically as the extent to which an intervention, as it's been uh, developed, uh, can be delivered, so as planned, right? The quality and integrity of the intervention, um, at least from the perspective of those who have developed it and who have identified what they believe to be the core components that are going to be uh, resulting in positive outcomes. So uh, you'll see here, again, a collection of different thoughts on, on how do we consider fidelity, the degree to which programs are implemented as it was intended by the program developers, that similar notion of if you develop the program, you're laying out what should the program look like. Uh, and then a note that fidelity is a potential, has a potential impact on the effect of the intervention on the health outcomes that you're trying to get uh, to, to move uh, if you're going to improve someone's health, someone's health care, et cetera. When we think about fidelity, we start out with this premise that says that the evidence-based practice has been designed, has been developed, has been tested, and shown to be effective. And so there's that concern, and the reason why we think about fidelity, there's that concern that if an intervention gets changed a little bit, is it possible that it will no longer have the positive impact on health that it did when it was previously tested? So the notion of, of fidelity is that if we have a good sense of how we maintain integrity of that intervention, we're increasing the likelihood that that intervention is going to have benefit when it's delivered out in the community. And in order to make sure that we cannot just assume this but can actually measure it, we need to be thinking about the different ways of which we, uh, with which we can uh, determine the quality of an intervention, right? So fidelity often is referred to as sort of a shorthand for with what level of quality are we developing an intervention so that it's uh, delivering an intervention so that it can have the, uh, the intended outcome. Uh, when we think about the kinds of things that we need to measure in terms of fidelity, you'll see listed down here, um, that uh, we, we need to be thinking about the, the, the method and what kinds of strain or what kinds of requirements it puts on our different systems. So as we look at, as we will, look at different methods of measuring fidelity, we see these kinds of criteria as, as something that we all need to be aware of, right? So whatever measures we're using to determine whether an intervention seems to be delivered as intended, uh, those different methods may have various costs associated with it. They may have various amounts of time uh, that, uh, that, that will be needed if we're going to capture the, the effect of information. We need to note that not all fidelity measures are necessarily valid, so we want to know how accurate the method that we're choosing to show the fidelity of an intervention is. Um, and we also recognize that different types of measuring, measurement of fidelity are going to require different levels of skill. Um, so one of the common ways in which we think about measuring fidelity is self-report. And self-report, we note, could be from the perspective of the person delivering the intervention, or it can, of course, be from the perspective of the person who is receiving the intervention. You'll see right here a couple of examples if what we're focusing on is self-report from the practitioner. We would be asking them, to what extent, just overall, did you deliver the intervention with fidelity, meaning did you 
typically adhere to a manualized intervention to that manual. Not at all, completely this kind of Likert scale. You might also see a way of asking what components of a particular intervention were delivered in the session. The typical argument being that if there's a set of components that you need to deliver, the more components that are being delivered, the higher fidelity rating would likely occur. Um, when we think on the receiving side, the person who is receiving the intervention, we're asking that question, you know, uh, of, 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 the, of the client, of the patient, of the participant, uh, which of the following elements did the practitioner go over with you today? So what did, was I aware of receiving from the practitioner as part of the delivery of this particular intervention? Uh, they might also ask if, if there's a sort of information dissemination component of that intervention. They might ask not just what was delivered, but how well was this particular component delivered? And you, again, see this Likert scale. It may range from not very well or not at all to extremely well. When we move up in terms of our intensity of measuring fidelity, we start to go into observation, right? So we are uh, an independent person who is observing the interaction between the clinician or the provider and uh, the patient or the, uh, the person who is receiving the intervention. And so typically, when we think about fidelity measurement, we're focusing on data that's going to be gathered by people who are trained to look for the key elements of an intervention that would be associated with its fidelity. So the trained observer, in this case, is watching and then coding the specific uh, components of the intervention and making a judgment as to what extent the intervention is being delivered with fidelity. Um, and uh, certainly there have been in, in, our, in various studies a number of different uh, types of people who are trained uh, to, to, um, to exist in this role, right? So it could be staff as part of a research team. It might in real world practice be supervisors who are trying to assess the progress of the, uh, of the providers or the quality of care that their providers are delivering. It might be peers. Um, and there are different ways in which this observation takes place. So certainly someone can be in the room or have direct access to watch how the practitioner is using an intervention. Alternatively, video recordings may be made so you get more of that visual perspective uh, and, and are able to, to see the back and forth between uh, the practitioner and the patient and, and make those codes as to how, again, faithfully delivered was, uh, was the intervention. And then often you'll have audio recordings where, again, you miss out on, on the visual, but you'll get a sense of what was discussed and you're trying to code which elements of the intervention were delivered on the basis of what the audio tells you. Um, so if you look closely at this, uh, at this particular uh, slide, you can certainly tell that as we look at the different ways in which we collect data, we're going to have certain advantages and certain limitations. Again, they go back to those overall criteria. On the advantage side, there are certain methods that might be more time and cost efficient, um, but on the disadvantage side, some of those methods may not get, like self-report, may not get as clear of a sense of what actually occurred. You're getting the perspectives of the people who were there and potentially reflecting back on something as opposed to coding or uh, identifying fidelity in the moment. Um, the other trade-offs may require higher degrees of resources or higher amounts of time expended. Um, and even those that would have, say, video and audio recording, there may be certain nuances that are going to be missed. Uh, you'll see on the video side, there may be, depending on how the camera cap, uh, captures uh, the, the session, you may not get all of the uh, visual cues. On the audio side, of course, you're going to get none of the visual cues, and so you may be getting only a piece of the overall delivery. Um, yet, these are still the ways, the primary ways in which fidelity of our evidence-based practices uh, are going to be measured. So when we think about each of one of our studies, we need to start looking at if, if fidelity ends up being a key component, which it is in most of our studies, what are the measures that we might want to use if we need to monitor and evaluate fidelity over time? Uh, so some evidence-based practices have specific fidelity measures that have been developed and in some cases have been validated as to whether they associate with uh, positive outcomes. The higher level of fidelity means the more likely that the person who's receiving the intervention is going to do uh, better. But not always. So you may have to develop a new 
uh, fidelity measure if there wasn't already one available. And so then you need to make uh, the, the uh, argument as to, depending on what method we're using, how much is it likely to, uh, to cost? And if we have limitations in our studies of what we're able to have access to or what we're able to, uh, to, to perform in terms of observations of specific sessions, that's likely to influence what you're able to choose in terms of fidelity measures. Importantly, in, in many cases, we need to be making decisions as to what are the components of the intervention that we need to assess for fidelity. In some cases, prior research will identify the core components of the intervention that would represent whether it's delivered uh, with, with high quality. In other cases, we may not know that. And so we have to ask that question of whether we need to assess fidelity across every component of the intervention or are there key, is there a key subset that will give us the best sense of whether the inter intervention is being uh, faithfully, uh, faithfully delivered. And so it may be an it depends, which you'll hear a lot over the course of, of uh, discussions and dissemination and implementation research. But it, these are important questions that you need to, that, that we want folks to grapple with. So on the other side of the coin, fidelity is often set apart from adaptation, the notion that if we keep things at, in, in, a, in a sort of similar form throughout, that we're maintaining fidelity to that intervention. But of course, we recognize that there are a lot of different places in which adaptation may creep in. And so this next section is really just thinking about what are the implications and what are the ways in which we might be considering adaptation of our interventions while they've been disseminated out to folks, while they've been implemented in particular settings. Um, this lovely cartoon is clearly biologically correct and gives that sense of how uh, species uh, adapt over time uh, to be lovely little cute dogs. So, um, we start out often when we're thinking about uh, dissemination implementation research by looking at what assumptions we make about the implementation effort. And so what I have on here are a set of assumptions that even if we may assume that there are some limitations on them, by and large, we've historically been, uh, been reifying them in a lot of our dissemination and implementation work. And so they are the following, that evidence and the evidence-based practices that are created, once they have that evidence-based label, they basically stay the same. Um, that similarly, once we feel like we know a community or we know a healthcare setting or a system, that we sort of feel like it's more or less gonna stay the same and we can just now focus on what are the strategies that are going to be best at getting those evidence-based practices to fit. Um, we also often assume that that evidence-based label means that it can kind of fit all people who, uh, who, who, might, uh, who might be eligible to receive the intervention. And, Furthermore, we often assume um, that if someone is choosing not to implement an intervention, that they're probably being irrational. And so what we usually set out is that the level of uptake, the level at which our in interventions are implemented across different systems, across different communities, the, 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 the bigger the better, that 100% would be what we're targeting. Um, but by doing this, these assumptions potentially limit our ability uh, to think about how these practices may need to be adapted or may end up being adapted over time. And so we just want to make it clear that while these are assumptions that we carry, it's always a good thing as we're uh, advancing our work in dissemination and implementation research to be testing these assumptions, to be saying, to what degree are these true? If we have an opportunity in our studies to test some of them, what more can we learn? So uh, what we see sometimes as this fidelity versus adaptation notion is, is akin to thinking about historical Spock and thinking about on the right Daniel Day-Lewis. So work with me here. On the left, what we see is Spock when he's happy, when he's lonely, when he's jealous, when he's sad, when he's angry, envious, tired, et cetera, right? He looks exactly the same. This is our traditional evidence-based practice that has the highest level of fidelity. On the right, we see, in contrast, Daniel Day-Lewis, and here's 16 different roles uh, that he uh, has performed in over his career, has, has won lots of uh, credit for those roles. But the point is that he looks very, very different in each and every context. This is akin to the idea that adaptation is occurring every single time that we think about the delivery of the intervention. And we ask that question, if we are going to err on one side or the other, what do we think is going to likely give us the best fit and the best ability to get our interventions implemented and sustained over time? We make an argument that we might want to consider how we 
uh, see variable populations, variable settings, variable purposes for which interventions are, occur uh, are occurring um, in light of our interventions and whether they might need to stay uh, clearly sort of faithful to their original concept or they might adapt over time. So, uh, historically, again, this sort of Spock view of intervention development and testing, uh, we consider the development of an intervention out of some evidence, and as long as it seems to be efficacious and then effective, we're pretty content with the idea that it's going to look exactly the same. Furthermore, we typically assume that the intervention should look exactly the same no matter what, uh, what site uh, we, are, um, we are working in. There are some consequences of that value of consistency that we then move to. So one of them is called voltage drop. And the concept of voltage drop, which is an assumption that we too often make, in my editorial opinion, um, is that as we move from an efficacy trial to an effectiveness trial and into dissemination and implementation. We're fully assuming that while we keep that intervention the same, the effect, the benefit of that intervention is going to be decreasing. And we come up with very logical reasons why this is gonna happen. There's a more heterogeneous population. There are more challenges in terms of resources, in terms of who's delivering the intervention, more comorbidities and all of that stuff. The problem here, at least as I see it, is that if we continue to assume this is going to take place, we're not really looking for opportunities to try to improve. We're basically saying that it will do no better than it did when we first developed it and tested it in that pristine setting. And again, this is an assumption that says that if we go along with fidelity and we don't really think about ad adaptation over time, that we fully expect that things are going to get worse. And the question here is to what degree does that impact our ultimate goal was just to try and maximize health and maximize healthcare for those who need it. A similar assumption that we make along these lines uh, relates to program drift. And so the concept here is that as we implement a particular intervention, we assume that the best that we can ever do is if we can keep uh, delivering that intervention in the exact same way in which we started. And what we also assume is that if we deviate, if we shift either intentionally or in this case unintentionally, and you'll em that, that's sort of emphasized by the fact that this intervention at the bottom right uh, changes color and changes shape a little bit, we're fully assuming that the expected effect is going to be much less than it was from the beginning. And so again, these are assumptions that we make, and so it leaves us with the idea that we should always try and maximize fidelity, and we really shouldn't be thinking about adaptation. But at the same time, we recognize within our interventions that there's a whole lot of ways in which we know that interventions can and potentially need to be adapted. And the typical way that we deal with this in our research enterprise is we identify a mismatch between the intervention in some setting or some target audience or some mode of delivery or some culture, and we say we're going to pull it out, we're going to adapt it, and now we're going to test it in a new trial. But the challenge is, that in each case, once we feel like we've got it adapted, we again want to hold it consistent. And so there is that question of, are we selling ourselves short if the only time that we're thinking about adaptation is before we start thinking about implementation? And so uh, going back to that notion of program drift, this idea that the impact is going to be negative over time if we're deviating, what it means is that we're not looking at the positive side of things, what some people have termed positive deviance. It means that we're not necessarily looking at ways that we might adapt the intervention over time so that it does better and better and better. And so again, this notion of a classical view of fidelity as the thing that we want to maximize and a sort of classical view that adaptation is something that we typically want to avoid means that we may miss out on ways in which we can make our interventions better and better. So uh, several of us, uh, Wynne Norton and myself, a couple of years ago had thought about how could we do a better job of pulling out a science of adaptation. And again, the reason why we bring this to you is because we feel that all of you who are focusing on dissemination and implementation can really contribute to building out our science of adaptation, which as I said right now, is somewhat restricted to this notion of what do we adapt and then test in the trial and then keep the same forever. 
So what we proposed was this notion in the same way that we have a genome or an exome or an exposome, that we think about the adaptome, the idea that we can pull together a solid knowledge base that learns from all of these efforts to adapt different interventions when they're being delivered in various uh, delivery settings. This particular paper was written in the context of prevention practice, but we believe that it would extend across all different care delivery settings, uh, whether it's clinical settings or community. So the notion of this adapt, uh, adaptome is that we have an intervention and we have some core components, but we have the freedom, we have the potential benefit of adapting in all of these different ways. If we figured out a more standardized way that we could generate this taxonomy of adaptation, we could distinguish what are the core components of the intervention, how might they be modified, and we can associate what were the outcomes of delivering those different ways of trying to intervene, then we could learn a lot more than we typically learn and build out that science of adaptation. Ideally, this means that we would then maybe have some implications for how we develop the next set of interventions. We would have some implications for how we consider adapting in real time as we implement. Um, but for, uh, for, the, for the most part, um, we're currently lacking this true ability to try and understand how we best tailor our interventions to individuals, to settings, without thinking about a much more robust effort within our science of dissemination and implementation. Um, so certainly when we think about different ways, when you think about different ways that you might want to be adapting your interventions, uh, there's a number of different ways in which you can sort of prospectively focus on adaptation and whether that's built into the flexibility while it's being implemented or that's something that might be uh, brought in uh, as you're readying your interventions and your studies to be implemented. Um, some of those adaptations can come from theories and frameworks. Some of them can come, as is the classical case, when we start with a target population uh, that we think that there wasn't a fit and so we needed to focus on what adaptations would make a better fit. Um, and then that pilot testing can tell us a little bit more for whether the adaptations that we hypothesize as being beneficial are absolutely beneficial. And then uh, thirdly, key to the adaptome, this idea that we can monitor how interventions are being adapted over time. And is there an opportunity that we can ultimately increase the fit of our interventions with the target population, with the delivery setting, or context. For any one study, it's really important that we focus on what are the kinds of elements that we need to adapt. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, Shannon Wiltsey Sturman and colleagues developed this taxonomy, this framework for how we think about evidence-based interventions, the different ways in which they can be adapted, um, so that if we can associate common measures with these, then we're a lot further along to trying to study adaptation in vivo. So Shannon, uh, Shannon uh, in her paper, uh, laid out these different uh, broad categories for adaptations. By whom are modifications made? What are the different ways in which the intervention is being modified? What level of delivery? How are we modifying the context, you know, context uh, in which we might be delivering a particular intervention? And then went into a whole range of different types of modifications that might be made. We may be adding or removing elements. We may be changing the time frame within which we're delivering an intervention. We may be thinking about how the intervention fits within other interventions that are being delivered. We might think about repeating different elements, making something more flexible, et cetera. Uh, this is really helpful as we're trying to think about each one of our interventions and which modifications are likely to come into play here, depending on the circumstances by which we're trying to implement. So a little bit more uh, in depth by whom modifications are made, you'll see a whole range of different people who may be thinking about these modifications, these adaptations, uh, you know, are necessary. It might be the individual practitioner saying, this doesn't quite fit with my practice. It might be a practice team that together is delivering an intervention. It may be researchers, it may be a whole coalition of stakeholders thinking about the cultural fit um, of a particular intervention, or we may actually not have a good sense of who else is out there who's thinking about adapting what uh, evidence-based interventions we're starting with. Again, in terms of the kinds of things that are modified, in some cases that may be modifications that are made to the content of the intervention or how it's delivered. It might be in terms of the broader way in which the overall treatment is delivered, how it's fit into the service setting, the community, et cetera. Um, we also may be modifying the way in which we're both training staff or how we're determining whether the intervention is actually uh, effective over time. Um, we know that we live in a multi-level world, and so when we think about the different adaptations that might be made, in some cases there are adaptations that might relate just to individual patient by patient. 
In some cases, it might be related to each provider, each practitioner may be uh, needing, to, needing to modify uh, the way in which the intervention is delivered. In some cases, it may be higher levels higher units of analysis. It may be that for this hospital, this intervention needs to be delivered in a slightly different way. Or it may, may even get up to networks, may even get up to uh, whole systems where we see adaptation is necessary. Otherwise, there's no way that this intervention can be delivered. Um, we, we talked a little bit about it before, but context uh, modifications, it may be in the way in which we're delivering a particular intervention. It might be different settings, different locations where the intervention is to be delivered or, or by different people, or that we recognize that there might be differences in the populations that require how the intervention is delivered. And as I said before, just lots of different ways in which the actual modification of content may occur. Uh, and so, again, the point is that not all of these elements will fit each and every study, but it gives you a sense of, or each and every intervention, but it gives you a sense of the range of different adaptations that we're currently not really focusing on as we think about dissemination and implementation research. So, key to a lot of this is that we need to be making sure that we're measuring not only the core intervention, as we've talked about with fidelity measures, but the different ways in which we might the adaptations of those interventions. And just sim uh, similar to what uh, Shannon Wiltsey Sturman had laid out, focusing on how well we measure what's being adapted. We might get more insights when we can understand better in terms of implementation science why something is being adapted. We certainly would benefit from getting a sense of who's receiving the intervention that is adapted so we can continue to ask those questions of the fit between the intervention and the population that's getting it. And then importantly, what are the outcomes that we need to capture in order to understand the impact of those adaptations? Um, so just to put this into a slightly larger context, a lot of this emphasis on fidelity versus adaptation is recognizing that there's a tremendous amount of dynamism in our field, right? There's dynamism in healthcare, there's dynamism in communities, there, there's dynamism in our evidence base. And so it would be short-sighted if we tried to screen out that dynamism or try to control it, because that, at least to our understanding, is not the way the world continues to work. Um, so just a brief note on how this relates to the longer-term view. Long-term, when we thought classically about sustainability, we've usually assumed that sustainability means maintaining that same high level of fidelity, maintaining the exact same look of an evidence-based practice forever. Uh, on the left side of this, uh, of this slide, what you'll see uh, are a group of people from 1963 to 1970. This happens to be, as you can tell from the link on the bottom, the Beatles. So this is the Beatles. If you just looked at what their hairstyles were like, just looked at what their eyewear was like, just looked at what their facial hair was like from 1963 to 1970. The reason why I keep going back to this is because most people who have followed the Beatles or other folks like them, um, would note that there was some advantage that was gained as they changed, as they adapted, as they evolved over time. That very few people who are familiar with the Beatles catalog would argue that the best single that they ever recorded, that they ever released, was their first single, uh, Love Me Do, or if you, uh, trivia, if you want to go even further back, their first recorded single uh, they had, was My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Uh, anyway, just a little bit of trivia there. Uh, but anyway, few people would suggest that Love Me Do or My Bonnie or any of those early songs were the best that they were ever going to do. And at the same time, we kind of freeze our interventions into that Love Me Do space. We consider that something like Sgt. Pepper or Let It Be or all those other things should not really exist, that we don't have an opportunity to learn, we don't have an opportunity to grow if what we're focusing on is maximizing fidelity for as long as we possibly can do. So the question for us in dissemination and implementation is how do we deal with the potential for our evidence-based practices to continue to evolve over time? What influence does that have as we think about the strategies that we want to use to support implement, uh, implementation and sustainability over time? What does it do to the expectations of the service systems of the communities that we're working in if we take on as a serious challenge um, that we should be always looking to try and adapt, always looking to try and improve the interventions that have previously been tested? And it asks the broader question for us of where do we go from here? Historically, we've really considered this world, even of dissemination and implementation research, to be pretty static. But as we start to think more about each one of our studies about fidelity and adaptation, really helpful to think about what are the long-term implications of what we're trying to set up. 
and what kinds of supports can we offer that will enable us to keep learning and keep doing better and better over time, as at least I would argue the Beatles did across their career. Uh, so uh, back in uh, 2013, uh, I, along with Kurt Stenge and Russ Glasgow, ha had put out this alternate view where we might think about sustainability as akin to looking at a puzzle piece and how it fits into the tableau of, you know, your, your typical sort of jigsaw puzzle that you're doing. We note that as we go around the circle, the shape of the puzzle piece changes. We note also that the place in which it might fit is going to change over time. In contrast from this idea that our goal is to try and make everything as much the same as possible, so the intervention never changes and hopefully the context never changes, uh, in contrast, it, it, it identifies change as central, that change is going to exist in our evidence base, in our interventions, in our practice settings, even in the broader systems in which we work, in which we live in, uh, and that the best thing that we can do is, be a, is, is pay attention to all of that change. Uh, you'll see here the quality improvement cycles, these plan, do, study, act cycles, which basically say, are there ways in which we can work toward optimizing the fit between our intervention and between our setting? It may require that those changes, as, as uh, Dr. Wiltsey Sturman had, had, uh, had laid out very nicely, that those changes may be related to directly the intervention or they may be related to the context. But important to say that change may need to exist. This definitely errs on the side of we need to take uh, account of adaptation over time rather than a sole focus on fidelity, and that's why we're bringing this broad topic uh, as front and center as we possibly can. So there are opportunities that come from considering fidelity and adaptation in that more complex, more dynamic uh, environment. Uh, the first one is when we look at our ongoing NIH uh, program announcements on dissemination and implementation research, you'll see that these same concepts resonate within the specific types of studies that we're looking for. We would love to see more studies of local adaptation of evidence-based practice once they've been implemented. We'd love to see the long-term sustainability and thinking about how things might change over time, not just remain in their original state. The idea of scale-up and de-implementation, all of these broader issues will require key attention to fidelity and adaptation. Even if we're not focusing on dissemination and implementation primarily, as you think about some of your other studies that may be earlier in that continuum, we should be considering the degree to which adaptation might uh, feature earlier. So what you see here is your typical continuum of studies from when we've identified a clinically um, meaningful signal through developing an intervention, doing feasibility pilot settings, and then moving to efficacy, effectiveness, and dissemination and implementation. We should ask the question of, at those earlier stages, can we build in more of a focus on how this intervention might need to be adapted or how, flexible, uh, how flexibly should it be designed? And so that means that if we have an earlier focus on who's going to deliver the intervention and whether that may range, or we have a focus on the ultimate patient population and how they may differ uh, across different demographics or different uh, contextual variables, um, and uh, that we may even be able to build in tests of different approaches to those interventions. In trials, we've seen uh, a rise in adaptive designs where we're varying the components of an intervention and trying to get a sense of which mix of components might work better than other mixes. Can we build that in so that we have more information to consider adaptations over time? Uh, and uh, many of you uh, will, will be thinking about hybrid designs where you've got effectiveness and implementation together. Uh, and is there an opportunity to think about how might we consider adaptation at earlier and earlier stages of the process? Um, so it's not, for those of you who are curious, that we are short on evidence-based practices. Just through the National Cancer Institute's Research Tested Intervention Programs website, uh, we have 187 different evidence-based intervention programs, all of which are framed in terms of how they've been developed and how they've been tested and typically have focused on how do we keep these things uh, at high levels of fidelity as possible. This is a great opportunity for us to think about how these programs might be adapted over time. And so would certainly encourage you within our cancer control space to think about these practices and asking those questions about the different ways that they might be adapted in real time, not just pulled into a separate study, adapted, and then tested once more. If we just broadly think about fidelity and adaptation, of course, it exists along um, a continuum. Right? So there are going to be certain 
uh, ways in which we know that programs are going to be implemented and supported with high fidelity. And then, of course, there are going to be others where we know no matter what we do, that program is going to be implemented at, at lower levels of fidelity. Um, at the same time, uh, we have uh, sort of conversely this notion of with the high fidelity is likely to come sort of minor adaptations, and at lower levels of fidelity, we're going to have a, a much greater degree of either adaptation or what some would consider reinvention wholesale uh, of, of the intervention. Some would argue that the more that we deviate from the original version of the intervention, the more that we need rigorous evaluation. I would argue that there's an opportunity to build in rigorous evaluation across the board, because right now we're very, very limited in terms of our information on all the different permutations or all of the different points on the continuum in terms of different interventions and high and low fidelity and high or major and minor adaptation. So again, this sort of gives you a sense of this continuum, and I would argue that this continuum can, uh, represents almost entirely a research gap that we can do something about. So, uh, in summary, and thank you all very much for listening, uh, we consider that both fidelity and adaptation are important, but even more important is understanding for the specific circumstances and for the specific intervention, what is that appropriate balance that we want to try and achieve. Of course, we recognize that where there's a disconnect between the context and the intervention, we need to try and improve fit. And on the other side, we certainly don't want to call into question or eliminate the kinds of elements within the intervention that are likely to yield the greatest health impact. There's no reason to turn our, uh, turn our back on the evidence base and how it was established. We recognize that when adaptations are being made, they should be made uh, with as clear guidance as to why, whether they're uh, informed by particular theory, whether they get input from the different researchers, or importantly, stakeholders uh, within, um, within the, the context, within the systems in which you're working. And we absolutely would consider um, that the choice of fidelity measures, and again, we went through a, a bunch of different ways in which fidelity can be measured uh, in your research studies is going to be incredibly important. At the same time, we also want to pursue those opportunities to measure adaptation. And so the best thing that we can do if we're truly trying to understand that balance between fidelity and adaptation is do a better job of understanding the implications of it, do a better job of trying to measure it where it exists, and to try the best that we can to associate that with the outcomes that we're seeing from our different interventions. Uh, we leave you with a whole range of different references and recommended readings that will give you more of this tug of war. You'll see that second uh, title in there uh, between fidelity and adaptation. But rather than viewing it as either or, uh, we'd really encourage people to think about where on the continuum do you fall and to what degree is an intervention originally created with that flexibility built in so that we don't have to, it's sort of more of a natural component of delivering the intervention. Uh, these and other uh, articles will just give you more of uh, a depth of different arguments about how we do this kind of balancing act. And so we'd really encourage you not only to review these, but to bring these uh, to, uh, you know, to experts in the field, uh, to bring them to uh, folks and, and, and challenge on how well fidelity and adaptation uh, sort of applies to your study and how can we advance that science along. Uh, so just want to say thank you uh, and look forward to uh, further discussion with uh, all of you.